Hello. Hello, can you? I can hear you, but not see you. Okay, just a minute. <laughs> uh, I think it should be okay now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, all right, let me introduce you quickly. <laughs> we have uh, Dr. Syed Gouda today. Uh, Dr. Gouda hails from Egypt, but he has a Hong Kong passport. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Gouda is a scholar and a poet himself. And um, he's a specialist on uh, Chinese and many other meters, poetic meters. Um, and has, has done a lot of work on that. So I invited him today to talk to us about uh, traditional Chinese meter and he will give uh, some uh, examples. And so let's welcome Dr. Buddha. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me, uh, let me start by sharing uh, this PPT I prepared. Can you confirm with me if you can see it? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Okay, today, as you can see from the title, we're going to talk about classical Chinese meters in the Tang Dynasty. Because actually, uh, classical Chinese meter is really so rich, is uh, for a person who is not Chinese like me. Before I uh, studied classical Chinese meter, I thought that uh, it's just uh, these four characters per line or five or seven, or that's all. But actually after studying uh, the classical Chinese meters in details, I discovered that it's so rich that uh, I don't think there is any, any other language, uh, classical language that that has that rich meter as I found in the, in the classical Chinese meter. Even, the, even when we study the modern Western uh, meters and free verse, prose verse, everything, you can find all of this in the classical Chinese meters. Today we'll focus only on the meter that was prevailed in the Tang dynasty. Uh, it came under different names. For example, you may refer to it as Lu Shi. In English, usually it's called regulated verse. Regulated verse meaning, you know, regulated. It comes in a pattern returned again and again. Or it can also, uh, you can also refer to it as Tin Ti, Tin Ti, either Tin Tian Te Din or this Tin meaning close or near these days. So it's in English, you may say modern form. And this comes in contrast to the Kushi, right? The Kushi is the ancient verse that was prevailed uh, before the, the Tang dynasty. In the Tang dynasty, during the, the, that golden age of uh, Chinese civilization, Chinese poetry and everything, also the meter was, uh, was so much influenced by this ancient verse, by the kosher, by the way they used rhythm and meter. But uh, it was more complicated. During the Tang Dynasty, it was more complicated. And because it still received that influence from the kosher, so there was another pattern other than the regulated verse, other than the li shi, there was another pattern that's, that was a mix between what was prevailed in the Tang dynasty and what they got from the Kushu, from the ancient verse. And the, so it was like mixture. And that was called, you may refer to it as Kuti. And here you have to differentiate between Kushu and Kuti. Kushu is the old ancient verse, classical verse, but Kuti is that new pattern that prevailed in the Tang dynasty, okay? And that was like a mixture between the, the rules and the principles of the ancient verse, Kushu, and the new meters and the new rules that uh, were introduced uh, during the, the Tang dynasty. You may also refer to it as Wangti, or Kufeng, ancient style, 
or you say Gufeng Shi Li Shi, meaning it's mixed ancient style regulated verse, or you may refer to it as Ru Li Gufeng. All, all, all these uh, names refer to the same thing. And that is a bit different from Li Shi, which is much uh, more strict. It's very strict, this Li Shi, because it has some strict rules uh, for the poets to follow. However, the poets during that time, they also, you know, they deviated from these rules uh, at will. Uh, Tu Fu did, this, did that. Li Bai was very famous of deviating from all, he broke all the rules. Uh, at will, of course, that uh, it's, he didn't break these rules, not because he couldn't follow them, no, because he was innovator. He was innovator in the way he used rhythm. Uh, and he managed to use rhythm to express the right meaning he wants to express. For example, when he wants to express um, a meaning of, of his, his meaning that he's in a hurry, he's in a rush, he uses this three syllabic, censure, only three characters per, per line. When it's so-so, then it's five. When it's prolonged, when it took longer, with the, according to the meaning in the poem, to, took longer time, longer duration, he extended it to seven, uh, seven lines. And sometimes seven lines followed by three lines and they can be read together. So it's like 10 lines. It, he's so genius. And uh, just a, a great example of what uh, the, the American uh, poet and critic uh, Ezra Pound said, uh, rhythm must have a meaning. Ezra Pound said, rhythm must have a meaning. But of course, only great poets can use rhythm and change the rhythm of their poetry according to the meaning they want to deliver. Levi was one of those great poets. So the forms, the form of the poem in the, in the Tang Dynasty changed or took different names according to the length of the poem. If the poem is four lines, uh, then it's called Chueji, quatrain regulated verse. If it's six lines, meaning sestet, uh, sestet meaning six lines, then it's Liu Chi Xiaoli. Or octave, meaning eight lines. The, the, usually, usually it's eight lines. The regulated verse, it usually comes in octave. Octave form, meaning eight lines. Eight lines. Li shi. And of course, all the others were used, but the Li shi ref, refers to the eight line uh, poem. Or Pai Li shi when it's more than eight, when it's 10 or more. And there is also this uh, Bai Liang Ti, which is uh, 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 every line uh, should be uh, rhymed. It's called uh, Bai Liang Ti. Uh, in the classical, in the, during the, the Tang Dynasty, the, the foot, the foot, which is uh, the, 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 the musical units, the rhythmical units that's that's used in the in the poetry, and you can find it in any poetry, English, French, any any poetry you you study. In Chinese, it's called ping and zi. Ping is the level tone, and usually we refer to it with this hyphen or minus minus. Let's say and zi, deflected tone. Deflected tone is we refer to it as plus. And in the old time, there were four, four tones. Four tones, uh, one is the first is ping, and then sheng, and then qi, and then ru. Uh, ping sheng, sheng sheng, qi sheng, and ru sheng. Uh, however, the, the modern uh, Mandarin, this Ru Sheng doesn't exist anymore. It still exists in some dialects in Southern China. And some dialects, still until now, they have this Ru Sheng. But modern Putonghua doesn't have this Ru Sheng anymore. But what, what we have now is that Ping level, the Ping Sheng divided into two. One is Yin, 
Yin Ping Sheng and one is Yang Ping Sheng. So the, the first and the second tone in the modern Putonghua, they represent Ping in the classical Chinese poetry too. While the third and the fourth tones in modern Chinese, we refer or represent this su, the deflected tones. There are some uh, patterns according to, to these four tones. Remember that these four tones were not used in poetry before the Tang Dynasty. Only beginning from the Tang, the Tang Dynasty, these four tones got more important and the, the uh, poetry and the rhythm of poetry was based on the regulation and the variations of uh, these tones of ping and so. So these are four formats, four patterns for the ping rhyme. If we want to know the, the rhyme, whether it's ping rhyme or the rhyme, we have to look at the even lines not at the odd lines, meaning it's not according to the first line and the third line and the fifth line. No, it's according to the second line, the fourth line, the sixth line, and so on. So for here, for example, this is, we take this as duity or this pattern to duity. If it's more than that, if it's Lucia, if, you, for example, these four lines, if it's eight lines, it's repeated. The same pattern repeats. So for example, this one, Zi zi ping ping zi ping ping zi zi ping. Then ping 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 zi 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 ping ping. That means this is the second line and this is the fourth line ends with ping. Then we know that this is a ping rhymed poem. The same with all the other patterns. There are different patterns, but all as we can see the second and the fourth ends with ping. Then we know this is ping rhyme. Here, for example, this is the codes of this, uh, the first tone, the first tone pattern. This is how we would uh, represent it, plus, plus, minus, minus. So we, you, you look at these signs and you just, you, you know right away that this is tzu, tzu, ping, ping, tzu, ping, ping, tzu, tzu, ping, 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 tzu, 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 ping, ping, and so on and so forth. Let's take an example of, uh, of the first pattern. We'll take a poem as an example of this first tone pattern. Remember the, the pattern, okay? Remember the pattern it starts with tzu, tzu, ping, ping, tzu. This is the first line. And then the second line is just to the opposite. And then the third line, ping, 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 tzu, tzu. And then the fourth line is the opposite of the third line. And we are going to explain all of that now. Let's take this uh, poem, for example. If we uh, read this poem and we'll try to convert all the tones into ping and z, we will find exactly matching the, the first pattern. Exactly. No deviation, no breaking away from any rule. Very perfect example of this uh, first pattern. You can you can go through it line by line, but here you, in front of you, you will you will find it exactly tzu, tzu, ping, ping, tzu, because third, fourth, then first, first, fourth. That means tzu, tzu, ping, ping, tzu, and so on. Okay. The second pattern, the second tone pattern is this is the the chords. This is the rhythm of the second tone pattern. Starts with three ping, ends with two tzu, and then the second line is the opposite of the first line. Then there is variation in the third line, and the fourth line is the opposite of the third. There must be some variations, and we're going to explain that soon. This is the third tone pattern, the fourth tone pattern. Remember, all of them ends with ping rhyme. Of course, the third, the third line, doesn't have to to be rhymed okay and uh, and even the second line doesn't have to be right if we look at for example here this is the first the first uh, pattern only the second and the fourth are rhymed so if we convert it into english rhythm rhythm english meter it will be a b a, C, uh, sorry, uh, A, B, C, B. 
it will be A, B, C, B, because the first and the third door rhyme, it's only the second and the fourth. The second one, it will be same, A, B, C, B, okay? But the, the third and the fourth tones, they have more, they have three rhymes. So the second line also rhymes. The, 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 uh, sorry, the first one, the first rhymes with the second rhymes with the fourth. So it's A, A, B, A. The fourth pattern is also the same, A, A, B, A, okay? So these are the four tone patterns, but with Z rhyme. Z rhyme, as you can see, the second line and the fourth line ends with Z. Then we know right away that this is Z rhyme and the same. All, this is the second pattern, third, fourth, same idea. So what is this Ping Z? Ping Z together, they are one foot one foot two into this is one foot and uh, when they are used interchangeably and uh, uh, when sometimes the the poet deviates from the rules and uh, use something called the inversion meaning change the ping into t and the t into ping sometimes to create more diversion in the rhythm but together ping t uh, this is one foot, but this is one foot. If we just say ping, so that means it's disyllabic foot. Disyllabic meaning it has only two syllables. Ping, so only two syllables, but it may come into or as three syllables, like ping, ping, so or so, so ping or ping, ping, ping or so, so, so whatever, whatever. And uh, in the Tang Dynasty, they, they liked also to, to end the many lines with uh, a word of three uh, characters, three characters. So it ends with ping, 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 or tzu, 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 or vari variations of both. So this is called three syllabic uh, foot. So the foot oh, that consists of ping and tzu, and ping and tzu could be could come in two syllables or three syllables, and sometimes even four syllables. Sometimes, rarely, but still happens, okay? And uh, they must contrast each other, must contrast in a couplet. For example, the first two lines, couplets meaning two. So the first two lines is one couplet. The second, the third, and the fourth is called the second couplet. This is the first couplet, this is the second couplet. The first couplet, the lines should contradict each other, okay? They should be variations. So here the first line starts with tzu tzu, then the second line starts with ping ping. And, and you can see he, this ends with tzu, this one ends with ping. But the, the second, the second uh, couplet is the same, but here we have to notice that the, the, the second line of the first couplet has to match, has to match at least the second syllables, has to match the first line in the second couplet, meaning the second line in the whole poem and the third line in the whole poem. But if the poem is more is longer than that, eight lines or, or six lines or 10 lines, then it's better to, to look at it as couplet by couplet. So the, we, we, say, we say it like this, the second line in the first couplet should match, especially the, the second, this second uh, syllable, should match the first line in the second couplet and, and so on for the, for the third couplet, the fourth couplet and so on. There is something called chan tui, chan tui, chan meaning parallel, chan meaning parallel, and tui meaning antithetical couplet. This is just what I have said just now. What I have said, this is called antithetical. The first and the second line must be antithetical. But the, the second line and the third line must be parallel. Let's have an example. Like here, for example, this is the first line. Look, 
So the second syllable is so important. Why the second syllable is so important? Usually the second syllable and the fourth syllable, if, uh, if it's wu yang shi like this, meaning pentasyllabic, pentasyllabic meaning five, five syllables per line, five characters per line. If it's five characters per line, then the second and the fourth are the tones that determine the rhythm of the poem. If it's seven characters, si and shu, then it's the second, the fourth, and the sixth, okay? Uh, the rhythm is not determined by the odd uh, tones, not by the first and the third and the fifth, no. It's the, we call it pivotal, pivotal tones, pivotal tones. This is the crucial, the central tones. It's the second, the fourth, and the sixth if it's seven characters. So look at this here. The second, a syllable in the first line is different from the second one. So this is antithetical. But this line, ping, must be repeated in the, in the second couplet, in the first line of the second couplet. So this is parallel. This is chan. This is toy. There is toy. There is antithet antithesis between the first and the second. And then we come back. We come back. This the the relationship between this the first and the second line is always uh, is always antithetical. Okay, so this is antithetical. This is parallel. This is antithetical, and then this is parallel, and so on and so forth. Okay, I hope it's clear. When there is some you know inversion, inversion meaning ow. Inversion, that's the, uh, a poet changes the tzu into ping and the ping into tzu, for example. We call it uh, a shi ji, shi ji or shi jan. That means there is something that is a, a parallel missing or antithesis missing in the, in the poem, in the line. There is something here we're, we are going to introduce some features of classical Chinese poetry uh, that are this feature is very important. We can't cover everything, of course, and we can't say everything about each point, but at least we'll try to, to have an idea. There is something called coping. Uh, coping, if we translate it into English, literally the orphan level tone. This coping, there are some rules re regarding this coping. This, um, for example, here, and this, it's wu yang shi, pentasyllabic, or qi yang shi, heptasyllabic. Kuping uh, occurs only, only when the poem has ping as rhyme, when it, when it is ping rhymed poem. Then we may run the risk of having this kuping, meaning what? Let me give you an example here. For example, if the poet changes the first, let's say the poet will change the first character here, this ping into tzu, hmm? will change this ping into tzu. What will happen? What will happen is that we will have something called ku ping because the two ping left to us, they are separated by two tzu, by two or three, two or three. Uh, so separates the two ping, that means this is an error or this is a defection. Let's call it this is defection. It's shortcoming. It's shortcoming. It's not, it's something uh, Chinese poets in the past didn't like. And they called it Gu Ping. So they didn't want to have this ping isolated. So when it happens, they have to this is called the inversion. When they change this ping into it, so it's called the inversion. When this happens, they have what they have to do in the second line to do something called counter inversion. Counter inversion meaning they come to a tzu in the second line and they change it into ping to you know to strike a balance in the rhythm. And this is the same whether it's five characters per line or seven, seven characters per line, it's the same. It's the same. And here also, this is a, the, another form, another pattern. It's the same idea. It's the same idea. Uh, if you change, for example, this ping into so that means you left this one alone. Then this is another defection. Uh, 
it's okay if if you leave t alone in one line, for example, this line. T t. If you change this t into ping, it's okay because the t is the rhyme. It's fine. So having uh, this ku t is okay, but having ku ping is not okay. Let's have an example here. An example here, this uh, ping ping t t ping. So it's the first ping ping t t ping. It's the first pattern, okay? Here, ping ping t t ping, the poet changed it to t ping ping. He changed the first character, which is supposed to be ping. He used g, g is t, not ping. It's zi sheng, not ping sheng, right? So that means it's it changed. That means he left the ping here, ku ping, and this is defection. So what he did, he had to change in the same line to change the zi into ping. So he said xian, xian is ping. So he strike the balance again. He changed the first character the, the tone of the first character from ping to tz into tz. And to, to make it up, he changed the third character from tz into ping. Okay. If the, the line is seven characters, it's exactly the same idea because the, the difference between the, the five character line and the seven character is just the first two uh, syllables. In the seventh, you just add uh, two different uh, two syllables at the beginning, whether whether they are ping or tz, uh, but the same the rule is the same, exactly the same. Okay. Uh, let's have another example, a poem by Tufu here. Uh, this the original pattern is tz tz ping ping tz ping ping tz tz ping. The rhyme is ping. What Tufu did is that he changed the fourth tone from it should be ping, but here ting chu, chu is tz, okay? And this is, this is as I said, one of the, the pivotal tones, the second, the fourth, the sixth, one of the pivotal tones. So he had to, to make it up by changing this, the first ping into pa, that means change it into tz, change the ping into tz. And also change the tz into ping, gui, gui is ping. So in the end, the line would be read like tz, tz, ping, tz, 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 ping, ping, tz, ping. Okay, so this is inversion and this is counter inversion to strike a balance in the rhythm. Uh, should we missing contrast when there is uh, missing contrast when there is a contrast is the antithesis that I just explained. The difference between the ku shu and the li shu is that uh, in the in the uh, in the old time uh, the, the ancient verse there was the the identical tone on the second and the fourth and the sixth syllables in each line of any couplet. It's okay if they have an identical. Uh, tones in each lines because as I said tones were not so important in the kosher tones became so important and uh, central elements in the Chinese poetry in the Tang dynasty so in the Tang dynasty there must be a different tone on the second syllable in each line of the couplet just as I, I give you example I don't know if you still uh, remember but i give you some uh, examples L like here for example the second tone is different here in the first line different from the third line the third and the fourth should be matching so this is antithesis this is parallel and then the third and the fourth come back to be uh, to change again okay so when when we miss this antithesis, this is called shu tui, missing contrast or miss, missing antithesis. There is another, also another feature, rhythmic feature in the 
the regulated verse in the leash that's called Xia San Liang, meaning the last three ping. Xia San Liang, the last three, like this, for example, this pattern. So, so ping, ping, ping. Ping, ping, ping usually or sometimes can be just one word. Not necessarily, but could be. And if it's T and Sh, then it's the same. The San Tzu way, this is one word. It has to be just one word, but doesn't have to be the same tone. So it can come as three ping or three tzu or variations between ping and tzu. And uh, later on, the, the critics added more variations like tzu ping ping, tzu tzu ping, and so on. So, uh, but this is just one word, one word that comes in any variation or even one, just one uh, uh, tone. Uh, the hour, that's the inversion. Now, that's the inversion. As I said, the, the second, the fourth, the sixth tone are the pivotal tones, the, the central, that if, if they change, the, the rhythm of the poem will be changed uh, and might disturb the, the lion rhythm. That's why there, there has to be a makeup there has to be a uh, counter inversion, just like, like the, the example I've given uh, here, uh, Tofu, he changes the fourth tone, which is pivotal tone. So to make it up, he changes the first and the third in the second line. Okay, I will give you some examples of these inversions, and because sometimes it's compulsory and sometimes it's not compulsory, it's it's up to the poet to to do it or not. Like obligatory inversion, uh, if the if the first ping changed into c, that means what will happen? That means you you will leave. You will have this coping, you will have coping the, the orphan one because this is a rhymed, a rhymed one. So you have to change this to into ping to have two ping in sequence. Right? If you don't change this, that means you only have one ping and then the rhyme. The rhyme is not counted. So they are they are isolated by two tuts, as I explained earlier. The same case and the same rule applied in the T and Sh. Obligatory inversion in couplets. Um, if tzu tzu, ping, ping tzu, if this ping, if this ping changed, uh, no, this is the this is the couplet. If this ping changed into tzu, so you have to, in the second line, the other tzu must also be changed into ping. Again, for for the sake of uh, st uh, striking balance in the rhythm and also to avoid this uh, grouping. Because again, if you if you change this into tzu, the ping into tzu, that means you have only one ping here. So you have to, to make it up. Uh, this is the five line and the same rule is applied in the in the seven character per line, that's chi and shu, heptasyllabic uh, verse. Another example here, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the example I've just given. It's, this, is, this is the same rule. This is the same rule. To for change this, so to, in order to avoid this uh, coping. Another example uh, in pentasyllabic meaning wu yan shi, uh, like here, this ping, this ping, changed into tzu. So that tzu here was changed into ping. That's the, the example I've given here is the align by one way. You can check the line. Tzu, uh, tzu, so, so, um, so, so, three, one, two, no, he tzu, so, tzu, so, ping, tzu, so, tzu, so, ping, tzu. So. Uh, no, no, three, three tzu. So. Uh, lower ru, I forgot, I, I missed the ru. So lower ru, niao, lower ru, niao, meaning uh, three, uh, three tzu, 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 tzu. So he changed it from tzu, tzu, ping into tzu, tzu, tzu. Okay, so what he did here in the, th the third syllable, he changed the tzu into 
品。人，呃，我，啊 ，this should be 人 ，should be 人，呃，物物 ，sorry sorry， it's 物 ，it's 物。Yeah， it's 物。So here he he didn't change the second one. He kept it actually. 品品字，呃。So actually, he kept. He changed only the first line, not the second line. Uh, this is called the half inversion. Half inversion when just one line of the couplet is uh, changed. I'll give you a, a, an example of it uh, soon. So you see that poets don't have to. Don't have to strictly follow the rules, especially in the Tang Dynasty. The 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 poets took liberty in following the rules whenever it uh, it suits uh, it suited them, and in uh, deviating from the rules whenever it suited them. Uh, this is another example in the Qi and Shi, the seven uh, seven lines. Um, here, this is the the fifth the fifth syllable changed from ping into tsu. So it's li, which is tsu, and here the tsu into should be should be changed into ping, but actually it's again it's hong, which is still ping. Uh, so oh, so so he he actually changed it. Hong is ping, so it's correct. Yeah. So here he he did it. While in the previous example, uh, no, he kept it. The previous example, he kept it, this one as so, though he had the option to change it into p, but he didn't. He didn't do it. He did it here. That so should be changed into ping. He 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 did that by changing using hong, which is uh, a ping. Ping Shun. Um, another example here: uh, the first ping changed into tsu, and so the third tsu changed into ping. And uh, as you can see, the ping and tsu here had to be uh, changed. So when he changed the ping into tsu, he had to change the other ping into tsu. Also, and this is the third uh, so also had to change it into into ping. So to keep this antithesis and the the parallel, I have just uh, explained. So see here, uh, but again here, this is these are the rules. But we can see that the first she is not exactly. Has not exactly changed, but what has changed is the third chung. This is exactly yes ping, and uh, if we go to the to the second line, is it so? Which is yes changed, and the third uh, syllable, he he's supposed to change it to ping, and he has changed it to ping tiang. So he made four uh, three changes, though he also had the 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 right to or the option. Or the freedom, the liberty to change the the first uh, pin. Uh, so there are some some inversions that are optional, optional for the poet. Like this first first one, the the pin could be changed into so. This is optional. Like here, this is the first pin. It could be changed into so, or remain. As it is as ping, this is optional to the the poets. Depends on the on the flow of his poetry, the uh, the muse, <laughs> how it inspires him. Depends on in the inspiration, the flow of his writing, and uh, also the the tse could be changed into ping or could uh, stay as it is. This is. Called half inversion. Uh, there are other, actually, something called bubbing, bubbing aid defects in the in the 
in the poem that uh, poets usually uh, try to avoid, but actually they don't really stick to this to these rules, or to, because we can find some of these defects still in the in the uh, 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 Tang Dynasty, uh, like Li Bai and Tofu in their poetry, we can find it. So uh, I will not go through all these details, but now I will give you an example of uh, a poem by Li Bai, a very famous poem by Li Bai. And we'll see how, we'll try first, we'll try to scan it, scan it meaning try to identify the pattern. Let me remind you of the patterns, the four patterns again. And so you try to identify the pattern yourself. This is the, the four patterns if it's ping rhyme. Okay, if you can take a photo, if you'd like to take, use your mobile to take a photo, do that. And, uh, and this is the four patterns if it's so right. So let me share with you another. File. In this file, I will also try to explain to you the difference between formal and dynamic equivalence. I'm sure all of you studied it before, uh, and you studied the, the translation theories uh, by Eugene Naida. He, he, he wrote about this formal and dynamic uh, and functional also equivalence. So uh, we will take one of Levi's poetry, uh, one of his poems to just as uh, a showcase to, to explain and to study it in terms of rhythm and how this rhythm can be translated into English. So uh, I will try in this simple presentation is to demonstrate how formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence work in poetry translation and examine their benefits and limitations, and also analyze some texts translation in both formal and dynamic uh, equivalence. And to show how reader's response uh, plays a great role. Reader's response is uh, a theory, it's literary uh, theory, okay? Uh, so it depends on, on you as a reader, how you would read the poem and how you would understand and analyze it. Okay, Excuse so me, uh, Dr. Gouda, yeah, would we have time for a 10 minute break or yeah, sure? sure. Yeah? Okay, uh, okay, yeah, sure. Let's have Thank a break. Thank you. Okay, see everybody again at 40. All right, everybody, we're back. Okay, shall we resume? Okay, so uh, we'll try it in, uh, in this uh, PPT to demonstrate how formal and dynamic equivalents work in translation and uh, also to examine their uh, benefits uh, and limitations uh, and analyze some texts, a Chinese poem translated in in English, uh, several several versions of this uh, of this poem, and also to show the reader's response and how to analyze it, and uh, the methodology will be analytical and comparative uh, method. This is the poem uh, Qing Yes uh, Sir. Of course, it's a very famous poem. You all know it by heart. Uh, this is the poem we are going to discuss and try to analyze today. Okay, uh, I'm trying to hide my camera, it's taking, okay. okay, this is better for me. All right, this is the, the, the poem, and actually, if we try to analyze it, 
according to the four patterns I uh, just uh, introduced to you earlier, then we find that it belongs to the fourth tone pattern. And if I ask you which rhyme in the poem is it, is this poem ping rhyme or zu rhyme? You want to know, you have to look at the second and the fourth lines. So this pattern is ping rhyme pattern. Okay. Uh, however, Levi made some changes in version. He made a few inversions in the poem at his will, without uh, following a certain rule or anything, but, but uh, he changed the third tzu into ping. Okay. And, uh, and so he changed also the fourth ping into tzu. And the second and the third from tzu ping into ping tzu. And uh, there is no certain obligations on him to, to make any changes, but we can see that uh, he just changed the, the tones based on the meaning and the words he wants to choose, to use and to, to create the, the certain rhythm he wants to. So the final outcome is ping, 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 tzu ping. Ping tzu 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 ping, tzu ping tzu ping tzu ping 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 tzu ping, and here is the the poem. Chuang Tian Ming Yue Guang, Yi Shi Di Shang Shuang, Ji To Wang Ming Yue Di To Si Gu Xiang. You notice that that I have divided the lines, each line into groups. These groups are called yin zu, yin zu, sheng yin da yin, yin zu, and zu meaning group. So sound group, you may call it sound group. But this yin zu in English meaning the foot, the foot, F-O-O-T. Uh, in Chinese yin bu, in Chinese yin bu, bu here is the, the foot. So also in Chinese you may call this this uh, hiatus or pause, tun, tun, tun meaning in English you may call it sejura or sezura, C A E S U R A. You may pronounce it sejura or sezura, meaning hiatus, meaning pause. So there is a pause after, after uh, a certain amount of or a certain number of feet based on the, the rhythmic and the grammar structure. We pause when we read poetry, we pause according to the, to the meaning, according to the rhythm, according to the uh, grammatical structure of the sentence, okay? Uh, so here, when I scan this poem, scan here, scan, S-C-A-N, S-C-A-N meaning to, to study or to analyze the poem rhythmically, metrically. This is called scansion, or you scan the poem when you analyze uh, the meter of the poem. So I would divide these lines or scan the lines this way, because the in the Tang Dynasty, the Wu Yan Shi, the, the, the five character or five pentasyllabic poetry is divided two, two, one, two, two, one. Okay. Of course, some people may divide when, when they read this uh, Wu Yan Shi, they may divide it into two and three or three and two. Okay. But it's up to you. It's up to you, but uh, usually it's two, two, one. And here I divided, this is my own scansion of the poem. I divided it into uh, this syllabic uh, structure, this syllabic units. So Chuang Tian, again, according to the grammar, according to the meaning, according to the rhythm. So Chuang Tian, I would put it as one yin bu, this one yin bu, ming yue. And then Guang, you may put somebody may say, oh, I want Ming Yue Guang together. 
So it's two and three. Okay, it's up to you. Then yi shi, di shang, shuang, the same rule. You may say uh, di shang, shuang, you want to put, to put them together or you want to divide them. I prefer to divide them here. Ji to wang ming yue, di to si gu xiang. We find or we notice here there is also a change. If we, if we read it this way, I mean, if we scan the poem this way, divide it this way, we notice that two, two, one, and then two, two, one, and then two, one, two, two, one, two. Is there any meaning for this change in the rhythm? Could there be any meaning? Maybe there is meaning, maybe there is not uh, meaning, but but uh, for me, I would I would try to to give it a meaning because for a poet like like Li Bai, these things should not be just read lightly or taken lightly. Uh, we as critics, we have to to find meaning behind it. Uh, so I think the one here and the so usually in prosody, prosody is the study of meter. Prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y, is the study of meter. In the study of meter, when the, when the foot is disyllabic, meaning has two syllables, that means this is the, the natural rhythm the natural rhythm, like in English, for example, iambic. Iambic is two syllables, tatam. So it goes tatam, tatam, tatam. And it's known that iambic is the, the rhythm of the natural uh, speech in English. And it was so also in the ancient Greek uh, poetry. When it's three uh, units, when the foot has three syllables, that means it's, there is speed. There is speed. You you speed up things. Like the in English it's, it's called the foot called anabist, anapist and dactyl, like uh, ta ta tam. This is in English ta ta tam. This is called anapist. Or start with stressed, then followed by unstressed, unstressed. That's dactyl, like tam ta ta, tam ta ta. If you follow this rhythm, you will notice, even if you haven't studied English prosody and meter, you will notice that there is a difference between tatam, 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 which is the natural rhythm of speech, and tatatam, tatatam, tatatam. This is much faster. Or tam, tata, tam, tata. This is when the, the foot has three syllables. If the foot has one syllable, then there is tension, tension. You don't feel comfortable. There is, uh, <laughs> the air is electrified. <laughs> there is tension in the, you don't know whether you should read it naturally or you speed it up. There is tension here. And here I see that Wang and Su, si, there is tension in the, in the rhythm. Why there is tension? Because, he is longing to go back to his family and to go back to his hometown. And he himself, his feelings is in, in, a, in turmoil. He's not in, in his natural state. In the first and the second line, he was in his natural state. He just lo looked uh, at the, the, the floor and he saw the fr frost and uh, he thought it's... Uh, uh, it seems like frost, but actually it's the moonlight. Everything is just in the, in the natural, is a natural being, natural condition. But once he remembered his family and he starts to long for their family, for his family to go back, then there is tension here. That's why we can see, can feel the, the rhythm has changed. From Chuang Tian Ming Yue Guang, Yi Shi Di Shang Shuang Ji To, then Wang Ji To Wang Ming Yue Di To Si 
question. Wang and Se, they stand alone as verbs. They stand alone. They are different. The rhythm is different from the first and the second uh, line. Let's have some uh, versions, different versions of how different translators translated this uh, poem. Because this poem translated maybe hundreds of times, right? And everyone used his own technique and his own way of translating it. Some of them tried to use the dynamic equivalence, some tried to use formal, and some tried to use both formal and dynamic, okay? Like uh, this poem here by, the, by Obata, uh, Shigeyoshi Obata. He was almost the first to translate it in 1923. Uh, he translated a lot of Chinese, of, uh, Chinese poet, uh, poetry, especially uh, poetry by Levi. So we can see that there is something different here is Ken. There are two versions of the poem. Chuang Tian, Ning Yue Kuang. Another version is Ken Yue Kuang. And here, Chi to Wang Shan Yue, not Chi to Wang Ning Yue. Okay, so he, this is in the book he translated. This is how he, this is the poem he translated. So if we try to try to analyze, if we try to analyze the, his translation, and try to to see if it's if it's formal or uh, or, uh, or dynamic. Uh, I saw the moonlight before my couch. So so here that is is the translation of Ken, and wondered if it were not the frost on the ground. I raised my head and looked out on the mountain moon. The mountain moon Shan Yue. I bowed my head and thought of my far off home. So, of course, in the Chinese poem, it has this parallel, Chi Tao and Ti Tao, in meanings, of course, Chi Yu and Ti. This is antithesis, the opposite meanings, but the, the lines they have uh, parallelism. Parallelism, Tito and Tito. This is parallelism. So in English also, Oberta tried to keep this parallelism. I raised my head, I bowed my head. This parallelism, he tried to keep it. So this is formal, I would say this is formal uh, equivalence because he tried to stick to the Chinese poems uh, as much as possible, in, at least in terms of meaning. He translated it almost very faithfully. He rendered a faithful translation. So I would say this is a formal equivalence. You may say, uh, no, I find it equ uh, it's dynamic equivalency. It's up to you, but you need to explain why you think so, okay, right? And here, the, the antithesis, as I said, between raised and bow, and also there is a parallel. Uh, there is another a translation by Sun Yi in 1982. And here we come back to Ming Yue Kuang and Wang Ming Yue, the, the poem that we all know by this version. Let's see how he translated it. And let's try to appreciate the English translation and try to find some uh, literary and uh, aesthetic devices in the, in, the, in the translation. The moonlight lies bright before my couch. The moonlight lies bright before my couch. How to call this repetition of L? There is, can you see there is repetition of L, bright before, and B, bright before. This repetition of the first letter, when it's the first letter of the word repeated, this is called alliteration. This is called alliteration, okay? So, I raise my head and gaze, look at raise and gaze. 
This is a rhyme, but this is not end rhyme. So we can see that he did not depend because of course, of course, in Chinese, the rhyme is guang shuang xiang, guang shuang xiang. So it's A, A, B, A. This is the rhyme scheme of the Chinese poem. It's very difficult to keep this rhyme scheme in English. It's not easy, of course. It's not easy to follow the rhyme scheme of the original poem. So you have to make it up by trying to, to, to put within the lines some other sounds to make up for the, the lost end rhyme. So here, this is what Sun Yu did. He actually used what we call internal rhyme or middle rhyme. This raise, gaze, this is rhyme. Raise, gaze, okay? And he used alliteration in bright before. Alliteration was the, the main rhyme in the, in the old English uh, poetry. Before Chaucer introduced and uh, it was influenced by, by Latin and French poetry and then introduced the end rhyme uh, into the English poetry. But the ancient English, the old poetry, old English poetry was mainly alliteration. There was no end rhyme. So here he's using, the, so this is very, very good. You can see line, uh, la, bright before. I hang my head. Sorry, I hang... Dr. Buddha, can you, can you share the PPT? Sorry? I think you didn't share the PPT. How come it's, it's in green? Is it? It's in green. Can you yes, also? Yes, a student left a message in the chat. Uh, Jojo, you can't see it? Oh, yeah, um, I can see no. Uh, thank you very much. Because there's oh, okay. no slide, not more. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Is Sorry. it okay now? Yes, it's okay. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know. Okay, let me show you the the few uh, previous ones. This is the poem. Okay, uh, this is the. Uh, I would I would uh, analyze the poem as a fourth tone pattern, right? And this is what he the changes he did. But uh, I don't think he followed a certain rule. He just did it according to his own whim, his own poetic whim. And this is the the, the poem. Uh, that's really pretty. Why didn't you say something earlier? <laughs> okay, so this is the poem here. This is how I divided it. Uh, this is my own scansion. I would read it this way, or I would analyze the rhythm. The rhythm. I don't have to read it this way, but the analyzing the rhythm, I think I would I would do it this way. Two, two, one, two, two, one. Then two, one, two, two, one, two. Okay, and then the, the uh, obata. This is how he translated it. There is Ken and Shen. This is another version, the second version of the poem. So he translated it literally. He trans we can see that he translated it literally. I saw the moonlight before my couch and wondered if it were not the frost on the ground, not poetic translation. We can see it, can feel it's, it's more like prose. Uh, the only thing that I raised my head, I bowed my, but here he just followed the Chinese structure. He faithfully followed the Chinese structure. That's why I would say this is formal equivalence because he tried to keep the original uh, text and the original meaning. The, the original, the source text was his focus. Uh, Sun Yu did something uh, different. Uh, Sun Yu did something different here. As I said, he, uh, he tried, even though he, he didn't use uh, end rhyme, but he, oops, but he he used other types of uh, other types of uh, musical uh, musical devices and poetic devices like light, uh, the repetition of the L, the repetition of the B. Uh, this is alliteration. The the internal rhyme raise gaze hang my head i hang my head the h again the repetition of hang head again this is alliteration all this creates musicality okay uh, thinking of my native land uh, couch ground moon land there is no end rhyme but he 
he did his best to include some musicality within the lines. Not bad, not bad. So I would say this is a syllab syllabic rhythm. Syllabic, he used syllabic rhythm. Of course, in the, the English rhythm, there is syllabic rhythm, there is accentual rhythm, accentual uh, rhythm that you follow the, the meter, like uh, uh, follow the, 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 the feet, like uh, iambic or anapestic, or there is accents, falling accents to, to punctuate the rhythm of the line. And uh, so I would say he also used formal equivalence because he also rendered a faithful translation. This is a very faithful translation, as faithful as he could uh, do. Uh, okay, uh, let's move to another version. This one is translated by Cooper, Arthur Cooper, American translator. So the Chinese poem has four lines. Let's count the English. Eight lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me show it to you one by one. So he has, he, he translated the first two lines into four and the second two lines into another four. He thought that this, this would be better better for his, for his English reader. Uh, but again, he tried to, to include some, some musicality, like again, before my bed, B, B, alliteration, right? And again, bright, before my bed, there is bright moonlight, three Bs, this is alliteration. So that it seems this sound, this S sound, so that it seems, again, alliteration, like frost on the ground. Lifting my head, I watch the bright moon. Lowering my head, I dream that I'm home. Again, lifting and lowering. The original poem is antithetical, G, D. So the translator here, we can't give the translator too much credit because the original is like this. But what we can, the credit we can give to the translator is that he used the, the lift and lower. Lifting, lower, and using L, both of them starts with L, another alliteration. So lifting my head, lowering my head, perfect, perfect rhythm in English. And then I watch, I dream, perfect parallelism. So it's matching the rhythm in the Chinese, uh, in the original Chinese text. But that was his choice to divide it into two stanzas. Each couplet, of course, Chinese, it's two couplets. In English, two stanzas. So this is a, a syllabic, syllabic, uh, syllabic rhythm. So uh, if we count the syllables before my bed, four, four rhythm, there is bright moonlight, five uh, syllables. Four, five, four, five in the first, and then four, five, five, five in the second stanza. So we can see that this is syllabic rhythm. This is called syllabic rhythm because the number of the syllables are almost same, very close. You can also write it this way. Before my bed, there is bright moonlight, so that it seems like frost on the ground. Lifting my head, I watch the bright moon. Lowering my head, I dream that I'm home. You can also write it this way, but he preferred, I have his book, he, he preferred to, to translate it in two stanzas. Uh, Rewi Ali, Rewi Ali, he translated it uh, such, over my bed, the moonlight streams. Over my bed, the moonlight streams, making it seem like the frost covered earth. You can see earth, he put earth here in the second. This is called run up line. When the line is cut and you need to continue reading in the second line, this is called run, uh, run up line. So, uh, making it seem like the frost covered earth, and then you have to stop for a while. 
But why he did that? Because of the syllabics. Then we, when we see that, we then we should realize if the accents are not so clear, if it's not accentual, then we know that it's syllabic. That's why you see it's eight, eight, seven, eight, six. And he rendered it in five lines, not four, five lines. So this is dynamic. And also the previous line dynamic, the previous one, this is dynamic equivalence. This is not formal equivalence. This is dynamic because his main target is the, the English reader. His main focus is the target reader, not the source reader. Both of them over my bed, the moonlight streams making it stream like we can see also bed. Some of them translated as bed, some of them translated as couch. Like Sunni translated it couch, Obata translated it couch. And there is another, a third, a third meaning for, for the word uh, Chuan. There is a third meaning. Do you know, anybody knows the third meaning of, it could be bed, it could be couch, and it could be something else. None of them translated it as the third one though it could be. Actually, in the old time, in the backyards, each family used to have a well. well. And the, the well is, is actually circled with fence or small wall to protect children from falling into the well. So Chuan here also could mean this well, this well, W-E-L-L, -L, where they can pull water, right? Uh, but all of them translated either bed or couch. That's fine. So he says, over my, over my bed, the moonlight streams, making it seem like the frost covered earth. Lifting my head, I see the brightness. And here you have, so you, so you can see there is, he doesn't stop at the end of the line. No, he keeps reading. You have to keep reading until there is a coma and then you stop. So don't be fooled by the, the, the line cut. The line cut doesn't represent how you should read it. So we know right away that this is syllabic rhythm. Syllabic, and if you count the, 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 the syllables, it will be eight, eight, seven, eight, six. Very similar, this is almost same. This is syllabic, and this is dynamic equivalence. Um, lifting my head, I see the brightness, then lowering it, See, he didn't repeat the head. Because in English, this, in Chinese, this repetition is so good, but in English, it may not sound that good. In English, when you, ref when you say head at the, be at the beginning, then you don't need to say head again. You, you, you say it, you refer to, to your head as it, right? This is the, the natural way of writing in English. But in Chinese is different. Chinese, the, the appreciation is different. So here, when we see that he did not repeat the word head, we know that right away that, yeah, he wants to render it in natural English, natural modern English. He didn't repeat the same words. Uh, lifting my head, I see the brightness, then lowering it and filled with thoughts of home. This is dynamic, 100% dynamic equivalence. Another translation, ah, this is a Chinese translator, Xi uh, Wanchong. Xi Wanchong uh, is a very famous Chinese uh, translator, uh, and uh, he's uh, very well known of translating classical uh, Chinese poetry into English. But now he's following a completely different approach, different methods. If we read it, before my bed, a pool of light. Is it hot frost upon the ground? Eyes raised, I see the moon so bright, head bent in homesickness, I'm drowned. Do you notice something from in this translation? Do you notice something? This is the first poem that has end rhyme. Right, all the other versions, none of them has, none of them has end rhyme. None. Couch, ground, moon, home, no end rhyme. Couch, ground, moon, land, no end rhyme. 
bed, moonlight, seams, ground, head, da da da, no end rhyme. Streams covered, sea, da da da, no end rhyme. This is the only one, light, bright, ground, drowned. So there is rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. There is rhyme scheme. So when we see this, when we see this uh, structure, we can see that he tried his best to keep the rhyme scheme of the original text. Even the rhyme scheme of the original text is A, B, A, A, B, A, 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 B, A. His rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. Doesn't matter much, doesn't matter much, but then the thing is that he tried to keep an end rhyme and he tried to keep a rhyme scheme. Not only that, while doing that, while, while rendering the poem in or, or following this formal uh, equivalence, he also tried to achieve dynamic equivalence, but not in the way other uh, Western translators did, not in their way. He tried to, to show off his mastery of English rhythm, English meter. So he tried, since the poem he translates, he translates as a, as a classical poem, classical meter, so he also tried to render it into classical uh, meter in English. So this classical meter is, is uh, before my bed, a pool of light. This is called tetrameter, tetrameter, iambic tetrameter in English. Why it's iambic tetrameter? Tetra in Greek, Greek meaning four. Tetra in Greek meaning four. Penta is five. Hexa, six. Hepta, seven. Uh, octa, eight, and so on. Deca, 10, and so on. So this is tetrameter, iambic tetrameter. Why it's iambic? As I said earlier, iambic is the, is the adjective of the of the word or the name of the foot, which is iamb. Iamb is a two syllabic word, two syllabic foot. The first is unstressed, the first syllable is unstressed, the second syllable is stressed. So it's the thumb. The second syllable should receive the stress, the accent. This is what we call accentual, accentual. Uh, rhythm. Okay, so here he says like before, when you read before, do you put stress on the B or the four? Of course, you put stress on the on the four, right? You say before, not before. If you put stress on the first syllable, you will pronounce it as before, uh, not English. So you have to pronounce it as before, before then it's iambic, tatam, before, tatam. So you would read it in English rhythm, you would read it as before, before my bed, a pool of light, tatam, 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 four feet. Is it her frost upon the ground? And again, upon, you see, you put the stress on upon, pun. And then the ground, the ground, that is unstressed. The ground is much heavier word, longer word. So the stress should be there. Eyes raised, eyes raised, not exactly iambic, but since we follow the iambic rhythm, then it can we can read it. Eyes raised, See, this could be spondy actually. Spondy meaning uh, a foot of two syllables, but both of them stressed. So tam, tam, like this. Eyes raised, I see, and then he returns to the iambic. I see the moon so bright, ta-tam, ta-tam, ta-tam. Head bent, this is spondy. Head bent, this is a spondy. Head bent, both of them receive this stress. Thumb, thumb. Same like the, the third line, eyes raised, head bent. In home sickness, I'm drowned. In home sickness, I'm drowned. This is also because you don't say sickness, you don't put stress on ness of sickness, no. But he ends the, the line with iambic, full iambic, I'm drowned. I'm drowned. This is iambic. And with the, the, the end rhyme, he manages to achieve this rhythmical uh, effect. Uh, and again, he, before bed, the repetition of the B, this is alliteration. 
Uh, eyes raised, I see the moon so bright. Head bent in homesickness. Head and homesickness also alliteration. Um, so this is a, uh, I would say this is accentual rhythm. When I analyze this rhythm, I would say this is accentual. Why it's accentual? Because the iambic foot is very clear. It's very clear before my eye. The accent is very clear. So this is accentual rhythm. Okay, and it's iambic tetrameter, of course, because most of the, po the, the many po poets, they don't have to follow exactly every line is iambic. All of them, all of them, including all the great English and American poets, they do this, or they use this inversion, meaning they change from iambic to trochee, to anapis, to dactyl, to spondy, they change the rhythm according to the meaning. So he did that here, so it's, it's not a defect. It's not, a, it's not a, an error, no, it's fine, it's fine. And uh, the, the equivalence, he tried to achieve dynamic equivalence by rendering, at least in the, the form, he tried to, to achieve dynamic equivalence as far as the form is concerned. But how much he managed to do that is another thing. I mean, for an English, a native speaker, if an, a native speaker reads this translation, will he enjoy the translation in the same way of uh, this one done by Rewi Ali or, uh, or this one by Arthur Cooper, which is a bit loose translation, a bit free translation. You can see that the language is more natural before my bed, there is bright moonlight, so that it seems like frost on the ground. It, it's very natural. And here also, over my bed, the moonlight streams, making it seem like the frost-covered earth. Again, very natural English. But here is not really natural English. Is it her frost upon the ground? Eyes raised, eyes raised, you know. I see the moon so bright, head bent, in homesickness, I'm drowned. You can feel that he he kept this drowned to use it as an end rhyme. So you can see right away that this is not natural English, not natural English. But as as far as the rhythm is concerned, he did a great job. All right, he did a great job. And this is how I would scan it before my head, uh, before my bed, a pool of light. Is it her frost upon the ground? Eyes raised, I see the moon so bright, head bent in home, sickness, I'm drowned, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum. Most of the, of the feet here are iambic feet. And we have another one here uh, by Seton JP and Kraya James. And this one is very free translation. Look at the poem, it's like really free verse, <laughs> free verse. And he's again using uh, the old version or the second version, Ken and Shen, and instead of Ning Yue Kuang and Wang Ning Yue, Ken Yue Kuang and Wang Shen Yue. So look at, at these short lines. Moonlight, just one word in one line, moonlight on my bed, or frost on the earth. Of course, when you read it, you, you have to connect the lines together. But this is how he would like to, to put it, to make it look, at least look like a poem. Moonlight by my bed, and by and bed also alliteration, or frost on the earth. I raise my head, it's the moon over the mountain, and my back thinking of home. This is a bit, uh, uh, he gives himself a more of liberty in terms of the form, at least, in terms of the form. So this is dynamic. Since he, he tried or he, he preferred to render it in this way, this is dynamic. Uh, he, he thinks that this, this sounds better in English, sounds more natural in English, will appeal more to the modern English reader. So, and uh, of course we, we can see that there is no, no accentual rhythm, so this is syllabic, and uh, there is no certain form. It's free translation. There is no certain form. Uh, there is no need even to, to count the syllables. We may count the syllables and 
to say this is syllabic, but uh, it's free. It's free form, free verse. Another one by David Hinton in 96, again using the second version, seeing moonlight here at my bed and thinking it's frost on the ground, I look up, gaze at the mountain moon, then back dreaming of my old home. Uh, again, there is no end rhyme. And uh, we can see that um, there is no much of uh, rhythm in the within the lines, except maybe a mountain moon alliteration. Uh, then, yeah, there is not, not much to say about the, the rhythm of the poem. And he tried to, to stick to the meaning of the. So it's syllabic rhythm. It's the first line has eight syllables, then eight, then nine, then eight. It's not accentual, it's syllabic, because you cannot detect real uh, feet there. And uh, it's dynamic equivalence, uh, it's clear. So I want to say, or what I wanted to say, that a translator of poetry, of course, poetry is the most difficult uh, translation, the most difficult type of translation. A translator of poetry can achieve a formal equivalence without sacrificing all the dynamic effect on the target reader, and achieve a dynamic equivalence without losing much of the message in the source text. Equivalence theory mainly depends on the reader's individualistic response in determining the effect achieved. It depends on you and how how you will like it. Like I, I the example I gave here, I said this translation by uh, Xi Wan Chong, uh, perfect in terms of rhythm, but in terms of language, is it perfect? Is it natural or not? It depends on the reader. Okay, uh, these are the the sources, and uh, actually, if you want to, if you want to. Uh, uh, read more about Chinese rhythm and about the ping and z and the rhyme. And I can suggest to you some of the books that I personally use. This is like dictionary of the rhyme, Chinese rhyme. This is a dictionary of ping and z. These books are very interesting and very good books that will really inform you a lot about classical Chinese poetry and the rhythm of classical Chinese poetry. And this one also is, is very interesting, very good one. So that's all for me today. Of course, I couldn't cover everything. It's almost impossible, but I hope uh, it's useful uh, and you have learned something. If you have any questions, I'm here. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Gouda. That was very good, especially your last uh, slides uh, encouraging us to really find solution and that they are there. You know, we have to, we just have to adapt and and um, find different forms, even if we cannot use the same one. But it is possible to compensate for a lot of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And does anybody have any questions? Yes, this is yeah. Jojo. Can I ask yeah. a question for mm -hmm. Dr. Buda? Uh, you know, uh, Cantonese, there are nine voices and uh, six tones. Is it better to read the poetry in Cantonese uh, than Mandarin? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I missed the question. What was the question? Can oh. you repeat? Okay. I, I mean, in Cantonese, there are nine voices and the six tones. It's more voices and tones than Mandarin. It's Cantonese, so it's, you mean Cantonese? Ah, ah, yes, Cantonese. Cantonese. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is actually, better. actually, most, yeah. You can, you can, you can read it. Are you talking about the recitation? How would you recite the poem? And about the recitation, right? About the reading. 
I mean, uh, only for uh, only for read the poetry because there are more voices and tones than Mandarin in Cantonese. So, for my own experience, I think that the lyrics in Cantonese is sound more beautiful than the same song and uh, in, in in Mandarin. So, is it the same in poetry to because, read the part? Because actually, um, most of the classical uh, poetry uh, were written in southern dialects. That's why it sounds more beautiful in Cantonese. But however, it's still in Mandarin, it's still uh, the, the, the tone is still there, the tone, because as I said, the, the, the main four ancient tones, the, the Ping, the Shang, the Qi, the Ru, only the Ru is missed, but still exists, missed in the modern Mandarin, but uh, still exists in some Southern, that's why you see, the Southern dialects has more as you said, there in Cantonese, there is nine, and some even say has 12 uh, tone, uh, but at least nine tone in Cantonese. So yeah, as you can see, there are more tones in Southern dialects than in, in Mandarin. So uh, I, can, I can understand why it should sound more beautiful in Cantonese, but, but it's still uh, in Mandarin, it's only, the, only that Ru Sheng is, is uh, missing, but the other three, the, the, the Ping, the Ping Sheng, uh, Yin Ping Sheng, Yang Ping Sheng, and the, uh, the, the, the Shang Ping, the Shang, uh, Sheng, uh, Shang Sheng and the Qi Sheng, the, all of them, they almost the same tone the same tone, even if it changed throughout uh, history, but the, the relationship between the tones also changed. So that's why we still read it in Mandarin and we still can hear the rhythm, like, uh, like uh, Guang, Shuang, Xiang, the rhythm is clear. I mean, the, the rhyme is so clear. Chuang Qian, Ming Yue, Guang, Yi Shi, Di Shang, Shuang, you can still hear the rhythm and you can still hear the rhyme fully. But maybe in other poems, yes, they sound better in southern accents, especially when they employ this rushong that's missed in the in the modern Mandarin uh, Chinese. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Hello. I, uh, I have a question. Uh, one day I asked my professor that uh, I, I said I really want to research on the little woman uh, in my thesis. And he said, he said to me that if you really want to do a textual analysis on little women, then you have to find all the versions that exist that have been published. Uh, I really have a difficulty here. Do you think it's possible for me to search all the versions of little women in Chinese in the world? L little women, you said, little women, the, the novel? Oh, uh, yes. Little women. Uh, or, or any kind of text, because if you want to research on it, then you have to find all the exist versions, the published versions. Uh, of course, <laughs> I wonder if you how... want to do if you want to do a perfect job, you have to, you have to, if you want to do a perfect job. But sometimes, sometimes we don't have the means to put our hands on every version. Sometimes uh, we can't find the, the hard copy in the bookshop some, or in the, the library. And sometimes there is no PDF. Sometimes we are helpless, but, but uh, as much as you can, you must you must collect everything that's written about the the novel you want to write about. Uh, if it's translated in different version, you must read the different versions and uh, try to find out how they are different from each other and what the scholars said about the, this uh, novel and and so on. So yes, uh, I I would advise you to to try to get as much sources and texts and materials about that book as much as you can if you if you have the means to do so thank you you are welcome any more questions
No, if not, then. Um... Uh, yes, excuse ah, yeah. me. Winston, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, what do you think what Xu Yuanchong did in his translation was preserving the most important thing? Uh, preserving the most Chinese uh, poets, poems. Well, you see, actually, I, I like his translation. And actually, even though you see modern, modern English reader, uh, they don't care much about this kind of formal and traditional rhythm. They don't care much because even nowadays, uh, English and American poets, when they write poetry, they don't write this way. They write, when they write poetry, they write, this, they write like this. They write like this, just a minute, here. This is how they write modern poetry. So this is how they appreciate. But, uh, but as I said, it depends on the reader. For me, I prefer, I appreciate this kind of, I still appreciate, I'm a, a still classical person. So I still appreciate this kind of, but uh, I, I say that it's still not very natural, but why, why I say he did, he did really a great job because it's not easy. It's not easy. Try it yourself. Try it. Uh, why the other, the other uh, uh, Western uh, translators prefer this uh, to translate it this way? Because I am sure they cannot do it. This they cannot do this translation. They cannot. They have to be either poets or really studied English prosody so well that they can write, the, they can translate, render the same meaning, this meaning into formal equivalence into this. And, and he, so he did his best to, to keep both the dynamic and formal equivalence. In terms of the, um, the form, uh, he did a great job, a great job. In terms of the language, we have to understand that number one, he's not native speaker, but still as a non-native speaker, in my opinion, he did a great job. And uh, as a non-native speaker, to to come up with this translation that's uh, that's uh, uh, perfectly rhymed, uh, perfectly metrical, uh, and also with this perfect rhythm, I think he did a great great job. This is my opinion. Even though most of Western readers will not like to read this kind of poetry, will not will not enjoy it. But maybe because they they are not well familiar with English rhythm. They are not 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 every native speaker is familiar with uh, with uh, with uh, English meter. Of course not. No, even many poets they are not so familiar with uh, with English prosody. So when I see when I look at his when I analyze his poem and his translation here, I think he did a great job in terms of rhythm. In terms of rhythm, he did a great job. In terms of translation, also he did very well. So I mean, he did not deviate much from the meaning, from the literal meaning. Chuang uh, Tian before my bed, Ming Yue Guang a pool of light. Uh, if you follow it, you find it's uh, it's more or less very close, very faithful translation. Yet there is end rhyme, there is internal rhyme, this alliteration there, oh, and there is accentual. It's not easy. It's not, it's almost impossible. And this is what he does in all his translation. That's why it's, uh, he's following a very hard path. He's walking, treading on a very hard path. It's very difficult to translate classical poetry in this way. So there is something you have to sacrifice. That what he has to sacrifice here is sometimes a sentence or a line sounds unnatural like eyes raised, head bent, sounds unnatural, and also homesickness. In homesickness, I'm drowned. Very unnatural, not natural English, right? He has to sacrifice because he wants to end with drowned. If we understand that, we may excuse him. We may execute them. Yeah, so it depends on the reader. Some Western readers, they don't prefer it this way. I don't, they don't like to read translation in such a way. It depends. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Actually, I we have been told by some of our teachers here in Lingland that what Xu Yuanchong did was not very natural. What he the English he used was not really, you know, naturally 
uh, accepted yeah, in the uh, English yeah, speaking more. world. But after, after listening to your analyst, I sort of believe that what he did was actually a self aware trade off that he, you know, he, int he intended to manipulate the English in terms to preserve something that he thinks is important in the Chinese poetry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is. Yeah. This is uh, w what I what I said. It's in the in the Western to to a Western reader, the, the English doesn't sound natural. Okay. But ask that Western reader, how much do you know about English prosody? How much do you know about English meter? But it should still sound natural, to I think, because even if you read classical, let's say, English poetry with all the the meter and everything and rhyme, it always sounds natural. But but he does not sound natural to me either, and I find that difficult to accept in poetry. He he doesn't sound natural, but even in English native speakers, when they have to keep the rhythm. They also have to sacrifice the, this naturalness sometimes. Take, for example, uh, Daffodil by uh, William Wordsworth. Daffodil by William Wordsworth, even William Wordsworth is the, the, wine who, the, 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 the one who championed uh, simplicity in, in, uh, in language. And he said that he, uh, poetry should be written in the language spoken by men, meaning the natural language. And he did that. Uh, in his poetry, but however, still sometimes he has to do, to use some unnatural uh, unnatural language, like uh, the daffodils when he says, uh, "I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high, or veils and hills, or veils." So he it should be, "I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high, over veils and over." He's talking about the clouds. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over veils and hills. But if he says over, that will break the rhythm. So he has to delete the V and to, to render it into one syllable or not two syllables. So it's or. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills. This is unnatural English, but he has to, to do it. And also when he says in the same poem, 10,000 so I, when he's talking about the the, the daffodils. He saw so many of daffodils, so beautiful. So, and he wants to say that he, so many of them. He said ten thousand. So I. This is unnatural English. Nobody says ten thousand. So I, or ten thousand. I saw. But Nobody that is that. that you could consider poetic license. That I understand, and it does feel natural to me. But it, but a, a, a line like this, head bent in homesickness, I'm drowned. Is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not saying it, it sounds natural. I agree with you that it, it sounds unnatural. I'm, I'm not saying it's natural. Mm. Uh, eyes raised, head bent, in homesickness, I'm drowned. All this sounds unnatural. Yes, I agree with, uh, with all those who say this is unnatural. But what I am saying, he is trying, so, he is trying to do the impossible. The, 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 form, English, right? the English, yeah. the English poets, the English poets, they don't translate. They are not. They are not restricted by certain meaning. They can. They can say whatever they like. If they don't like it, they can change it. I mean, they they let the 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 poetry flow, and the meanings flow according to what they want to say. But here, he is restricted by certain words, by certain meanings. He has to express this meaning, and to express it in a certain rhyme, end rhyme, and certain rhythm, certain meter. This is almost impossible, impossible, to do it, to do it in this way. It's not yet. Yeah, sometimes some parts, some parts don't sound natural in English, but but I still bearing in mind, and because I understand what he's trying to do, I I think he he, he did a great job in terms of rhythm, and we have to he has to, yeah he had to sacrifice the language the naturalness of the language. Yes, sometimes this is understood, but for those English, as I said, those English critic. I am sure they are not well familiar with uh, uh, because I talk to with with or I listen to some and uh, I'm hundred percent sure that they did not study. They cannot write in this way. They cannot translate it this way. If you ask them just for the sake of fun, 
just for the sake of fun, translated, translate this poem in metrical rhythm like this, like this one done by Xi Yontong. Just for the sake of fun, I can bet that they cannot. And it will be very difficult. It will be very, very difficult and may come up with a version that's not even half good as this one. So I, yeah, he, the language doesn't sound natural uh, sometimes, uh, but uh, it's for the sake he, he preferred to keep the rhythm, the meter, the musicality, and he had to sacrifice this natural language. Okay. So I, I, I feel I feel that I, I myself I, I can't be harsh on him because I know what he's trying to do. <laughs> And I know how hard and how difficult it is. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we need to stop now. We're way over time. Okay. So thanks wow. everybody for being patient. And thanks Dr. Gouda for a great talk. Lots of insights and ideas. Um, thank you. And um, okay, I will see everybody next week. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Um, hi. Yeah. yeah. Can you um, I guess share Dr. Gula's email too, because I want to ask him something about um further studies. Mm -hmm. You know, in this field, because I'm really interested in a uh, meter and rhythms in poetry translation. So yeah. Yeah, Dr. Gouda, do you want to share your email in the chat? Sure. sure. Can you uh, write it in the chat? Okay. Thank sure. you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, bye everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.